Top-level diplomatic talks are continuing in an attempt to defuse the crisis over Ukraine. French President Emmanuel Macron is meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow today. Macron will then head to Kiev and meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky Tuesday. On Friday, Putin traveled to Beijing to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping and attend the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. The two leaders signed a joint statement calling on the United States and other Western nations to, quote, abandon the, ideologi the ideologized uh, approaches of the Cold War. They also called for no more expansion of NATO. Meanwhile, Germany's new chancellor, Olaf Scholz, will meet with President Biden at the White House today. Over the weekend, U.S. officials claimed Russia now has in place 70 percent of the forces it needs to invade Ukraine. Meanwhile, the U.S. continues to send military equipment and munitions to Ukraine. CNN reports an 80-ton shipment of military aid arrived recently. It's the eighth U.S. shipment in recent days. U.S. intelligence assessments reportedly predict a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine could lead to 50,000 civilian deaths in Ukraine. President Putin's denied claims he plans to invade Ukraine. For more more were joined by two guests. Anatoly Levin, a senior fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, author of numerous books on Russia and the former Soviet republics, including Ukraine and Russia, a fraternal rivalry. We are also joined in New York by Masha Gessen, award-winning Russian-American journalist and staff writer at The New Yorker, where their most recent piece is headlined, How a City Close to the Ukraine-Russia Border Has Been Shaped by War. Masha, let's begin with you. You're just back from Kiev. Can you just describe the scene on the ground, the people you spoke to, how people are preparing or not for a confrontation? Thank you, Amy, um, and thank you for having me. So uh, I, I spent some time in Kiev and also in Kharkiv, which is a city close to the Russian-Ukrainian border. Um, I'd say the situation in those places is a little bit different. People in Kharkiv have been living close to the war, right? And it's important to remember that when we talk about Russia invading Ukraine, well, that happened eight years ago. Uh, we're actually coming up on an, on an anniversary. Um, we're talking. You know, so what? So what they've had for the last eight years is a simmering armed conflict that continues to claim lives on a daily basis. Right? Every day, people die in what Ukrainians refer to as the ungoverned territories, which are the two self-proclaimed republics: the Luhansk People's Republic and the Donetsk People's Republic in the east of Ukraine. <clears throat> which is where <clears throat> Russia invaded eight years ago. Kharkiv is right next to those places. Kharkiv knows what it's like to be in that uh, state of simmering conflict. And more important, I think, in a state of total lawlessness and ongoing violence that people in those places are, are, are experiencing. So, and this is something that I think Russians don't quite understand, that over the eight years of that conflict, people in Kharkiv have really forged a Ukrainian identity that is entirely separate, and this is what Americans fail to understand, entirely separate from their linguistic identity, right? But a very strong national identity. And there's a kind of fortification of patriotic feeling that always happens in wartime. We know this. And you feel it very strongly in Kharkiv. So a lot of people are kind of saying, okay, bring it on. We've, we've, we've known for a long time this was going to happen. Obviously, this was bravada. Uh, in a lot of ways, obviously, Russia is capable of using overwhelming force that would lead to an incredible amount of bloodshed. But I think people there are very far from where they were eight years ago, which was, you know, caught unawares, uh, where something like the Russian invasion was just unimaginable eight years ago. <clears throat> These days, I think they feel like they know what it's like and they're prepared as awful as it's going to be. Kiev is a different story. In Kiev, people, I think, are living sort of on two tracks. One, they've, uh, they think it's completely, you know, it is an unimaginable to them. They haven't been living next to a war zone for eight years. So the possibility of, of bombing of Kiev, which is part of what, unfortunately, uh, is, is predicted by some analysts, just seems absurd to them. And at the same time, they're thinking, yeah, there's nothing you can't, they can't plan for the for, for next week, uh, because you have been in this, you're, you're placed in the state of suspended animation. So there's a real sense of double think in Kyiv. 
And then talk about the people that you spoke to and how, in everyday life, men, women, children are planning. I mean, from the United States perspective, the U.S. pulled back the word imminent invasion. But they are suggesting that's the case every day. But I got the sense from your pieces, and um, especially the piece you wrote, How a City Close to— uh, the piece that you wrote um, on, um, on, the on, yeah. on Kiev, uh, you know, people are taking different approaches, whether to flee right. or to stay and fight. So. Um the Ukrainian government, understandably, has been trying to project a sort of sense of calm, because part of what's happening is this Russian brinksmanship is having a devastating effect on the Ukrainian economy. Uh, even without an invasion, it's an incredibly destructive thing for, for the country. So um, the president of Ukraine has been, and, and some of his ministers have been saying, look, what we're seeing now is not substantially different than anything that we saw, saw over the course of 2021. They keep amassing troops on the border. They keep pulling them up and then pulling them back. We can't react to every one of those uh, fluctuations as though war were imminent. We have to keep living our lives. Otherwise, this is incredibly destructive. <clears throat> and, and I think to some extent he has succeeded in projecting a sort of calm. <clears throat> and people are really saying, you know, what, why? What's all this talk of, of war? Is the this is so media driven? It's amazing. Um, I, you know, I, I had dozens of interviews in the course of my time in Ukraine, and I don't think there was a single person who didn't use the phrase "wag the dog," in describing what they were experiencing. And at the same time, they explain that, that the for people who aren't familiar with that reference, Masha. Uh, the reference is, is is to the film "Wag the Dog," where. Um, a war where the a U.S. administration, uh, a fictional U.S. administration sort of manufactures a war in Albania, I believe, uh, which I think people in the administration don't even realize is a real country. And it's a completely media-driven phenomenon. Uh, and the war is sort of the side effect of a media controversy. I'm summing it up from memory. It's been a long time, um, more than 20 years. But, um, but um, but that's the movie, and so 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 a lot of people are perceiving it as a as a media driven phenomenon, as something that's happening in a kind of virtual space, except it's going to affect them physically uh, and 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 tragically. So, uh, the mayor of Kiev, uh, or the deputy mayor of Kiev, said last month, uh, or actually in December now, said, "Look, you should ha you should have a go bag. You should be prepared." And that was a first wave of panic. So people have been stocking up on supplies. Have people have made contingency plans? Some people are planning to go west to western Ukraine, which they assume is not going to be affected by warfare. Some people are planning to leave the country. Some people are planning to send their kids out of the country. Some people are stocking up on gasoline for generators and planning maybe communal living so they can help each other in case there is no. Um, there's no electricity, there's no internet, uh, there are food shortages, et cetera. I mean, we're still talking about winter, right? So people are very concerned about be, being able to heat their homes. And there's also a real mobilization effort. Uh, there's a thing called territorial defense, which is a kind of civilian slash military reserve that is part of the military chain of command. They have had uh, an extraordinary number of people signing up just in the last uh, weeks and, 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 and couple of months. So they're training every weekend. And you really do have a sense of it. On the one hand, you're sort of walking around Kiev. It's a, it's a beautiful, vibrant city with lots of great food. People are sitting around in restaurants. It's very easy to forget about COVID there. And at the same time, every conversation turns to subjects of preparedness, and a lot of people are actually actively either taking, uh, you know, training militarily or thinking of at least taking up arms. I wanted to bring Anatole Levin into the conversation of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. You've got um, Macron in uh, Moscow today, then headed to Kiev uh, to meet with the Ukrainian president, meeting with Putin today. You've got the new German chancellor, Schultz, in Washington, D.C., meeting with Biden. Um, <clears throat> your sense of what 
could happen right now? Well, I think there is a good deal of room, actually, for uh, diplomatic progress and at least a sort of interim uh, diplomatic agreement uh, around uh, issues that have been uh, either raised or left open by the American response to Russia's démarche. Uh, in other words, um, uh, arms limitation agreements, especially on the stationing of missiles, uh, a resumption of nuclear arms reduction talks, and perhaps um, a, a, at least an informal uh, agreement on a moratorium or delay uh, on NATO membership for, for Ukraine, which actually sacrifices nothing because nobody thinks that Ukraine can join NATO in the foreseeable future anyway. So this is a point of principle rather than a point of, um, of actual reality. And then beyond that, um, there is the issue that um, um, was also raised uh, both by the American response uh, and by President Macron, uh, but somewhat vaguely, uh, which is the possibility of some kind of new European security architecture uh, in which um, Russia would have uh, you know, at least more of a, a consultative role. So I think that uh, there is a diplomatic way forward. And I myself um, would actually follow what the Ukrainian government has been saying uh, and say that a Russian invasion is not imminent. Because the, um, a good many people said that um, the, the Russian demands uh, were pitched so high that uh, Moscow must have known that uh, they couldn't be accepted. And this was simply a pretext for Russian invasion. Well, I think if that was true, then the Russians would have invaded already. Um, there, there clearly is a, a, a desire in Moscow um, to pursue a diplomatic path. Now, where that will lead, we don't know. And of course, uh, war remains a, a distinct possibility. But I would not myself say that we, um, we need to be immediately. You've written of... a piece how Emmanuel Macron can end the threat of war in Europe. Um, the French president can borrow a phrase from Charles de Gaulle and say no to Ukraine joining NATO. Do you think it's that simple, Anatole? Uh, well, it's not simple for Macron. Uh, obviously, he is under multiple different pressures. Um, France is highly dependent, for example, on the United States to support its efforts against um, Islamist revolt in Western Africa. Uh, but in one way, it is simple, because, as I said, uh, it's not actually possible for Ukraine to join NATO, uh, not merely in the, you know, in the next few years, but basically ever. And the reason for that is very simple. Ukraine, you know, as um, Dr. Gesson said, is involved uh, in a frozen de facto conflict uh, with Russia, and bringing, NATO in, uh, bringing Ukraine into NATO would imply uh, NATO sending very serious numbers of troops, Cold War num numbers, 100,000 American troops, to defend Ukraine against Russia. Well, that is simply not going to happen. Um, you know, apart from anything else, um, nobody wants war with Russia, and nobody wants that kind of distraction from China. Uh, and NATO's European members are most certainly not going to send troops to defend Ukraine. So the whole issue of Ukraine's NATO membership is, in fact, purely theoretical. So that in some respects, this whole argument is an argument about nothing. On both sides, it must be said, Russian as well as the West. Masha Gessen, your response. No, I, I, I agree with um, with Anatole, and uh, I, I. But we have to think about why, when it's a debate about nothing, when Russia is perfectly well aware that the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO is zero. Why is Russia raising this uh, topic, and why is Russia demanding guarantees? Uh, and Russia is demanding uh, guarantees that Ukraine will never join NATO guarantees of something that is not, not going to happen. So uh, I agree that it's a pretext, um, but it's also a demand for, um, for, for something bigger, right? And it's, it's, um, and it, it's, it's a demand for the, exactly the kind of attention that Russia is getting right now, um, which is, you know, the whole world is swirling, the whole Western world is swirling around Russia trying to convince Vladimir Putin to step back. 
The danger here is that considering that Russia's demands will never be fully met, I don't think it's going to get a guarantee, um, even though, again, it will change nothing in, 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 the, in the real state of things, because it's not going to get a complete guarantee. And at a certain point, it's going to lose the world's attention. That's when I think the danger point comes. Because the purpose of this is not, you know, again, because we know this is a pretext, the purpose is to do something else. And what is the something else? A large part of it is creating a sense among Russians that, that Russia matters, that Vladimir Putin is a world leader, that, um, that he says something and the whole world gets moving and that he can command the world's attention. Uh, it is, it taps into feelings of resentment and, uh, and, and, and the sense of being left out and diminished that, that Putin's politics consistently uh, tap into. And when he loses that opportunity, I think that's, that's when it becomes really risky. So I don't, uh, I don't think there's an imminent invasion, but I also don't see how in the long term this game of brinksmanship can end with anything but a big war. Anatole Levin, let me ask you about um, the German chancellor meeting with Biden in Washington and what you feel should happen there, and also the meeting of Xi and Putin, uh, the Chinese and Russian leaders, uh, in Beijing last week, which was highly significant, the first time Xi met with a world leader in two years since uh, the pandemic and that kind of alliance forming, even if they have plenty of differences, the U.S. pushing and NATO pushing essentially them together. Well, I mean, Schultz in, in Washington is, of course, very anxious to present a united front to Russia uh, as a, a, a deterrent to any Russian action, uh, while at the same time praying, frankly, that um, Russia, of course, will not invade and that uh, no massive NATO sanctions will be necessary. Uh, because uh, let's not forget, talking about intensified sanctions for an American uh, is very cheap, because America has very little trade with Russia and, of course, does not uh, has no investment in Russia uh, and does not depend on uh, Russia for energy imports. Massive sanctions against Russia for Germans uh, is very expensive. So, of course, the German government is hoping that it will not have to impose them. But for the moment, the stress is obviously on a, a combination of a united Western front, uh, but also, as I say, this uh, fairly hopeful diplomatic uh, process with Moscow. Uh, as far as uh, Putin and Xi, or rather Russia and China, are concerned, uh, obviously they have a great many interests in common in pushing back against the West. Uh, but this is not going to be an alliance. Um, China is not offering to fight for Russia in Ukraine. China has not recognized the Russian annexation of Crimea. And Russia is certainly not offering to fight for China over Taiwan. The biggest question is, uh, if Russia does invade Ukraine and if massive Western economic sanctions are imposed, how far will China go in supporting the Russian economy? Uh, we don't know. Um, my sense, however, is that so far China has been fairly cautious uh, about this, apart from anything else, because, of course, a war in Ukraine with uh, massive uh, economic sanctions would be extremely disruptive of the world economy, of world energy prices, and at least in the short term would be very damaging for China. So this remains a partnership, uh, but I, I think well, well short of an alliance. But if I could just push back a little on what Masha said, I think it is partly at least mistaken to talk about Putin's you know, domestic agendas and Russian feelings here. Uh, there are core Russian national security interests held by the Russian establishment as a whole and by a large part of the Russian people, which are in certain respects extremely close to those of the United States, you know, when it comes to its own backyard in Central America. Uh, now, those are, those are interests that America expects to be taken very seriously in its case, uh, and, well, so does Russia. Masha Gessen. Uh, well, I think that Putin's primary concern is not strategic, uh, but, you know, obviously we can, uh, we can argue about what's in that man's head uh, till the cows come home, and that's part of the problem with dealing with a 
closed uh, secretive regime, especially one that has been in power for so long. But I think what Putin is seeing is that his uh, he's getting old. His his regime is uh, is showing signs of wear. His popularity has waned, and the models available for um, either a safe retirement or continuing his uh, his rule in perpetuity are not encouraging for him. He has seen neighboring Belarus, which. Um, which, which sustained the regime basically through consistent political repression, erupt in mass protests in August of 2020. And the only way that Alexander Lukashenko has been able to sustain the regime is with Russia's help and the brutal use of force. He saw neighboring Kazakhstan attempt a sort of soft, fake transfer of power um, with uh, guarantees of security for the outgoing uh, president, Nursultan Nazarbayev, and break into what appeared to be mass protests. And again, you, the use of force, and in fact, the only use of military power by the post-Soviet security organization uh, uh, occurred in Kazakhstan earlier this year. And so there, it has to be going through Putin's mind. How is he going to sustain his personal power and the durability of his regime um, going forward. And I think that that's uh, the only model that has worked for him is a model of extreme uh, of sustaining his legitimacy through sort of pumping up his popularity. And that happens by showing that he's a powerful man on the world stage, but also the biggest boost to his popularity ever was the annexation of Crimea in 2014. He can't recreate it. But I think he keeps looking in the direction of Ukraine to see what he could do that's, that will be at least somewhat like it. And this is um, another, I think, very important consideration, which is sanctions. From Putin's point of view, sanctions that were imposed on Russia in 2014 by both Western European countries um, and the United States were ultimately a net profit. Right. Um, yes, the Russian economy, if you're looking from the West, you would say the Russian economy took a huge hit. Looking from Russia, it spurred domestic production, it mobilized the population, it secured his political popularity. It was an all-around win. And so um, thinking of sanctions as, as a deterrent, I think, has to be at least complicated. We can't possibly assume that, um, that he thinks about sanctions as a net loss. And finally, Anatoly, even isn't Trump—and I do mean President Trump actually uh, getting what he wants. He was pushing for NATO countries spending 4 percent of their GDP on military weapons. Uh, the countries aren't near there. The goal written—the uh, goal was 2 percent. But it is increasing dramatically. Um, what about what—who is ultimately winning here? The weapons manufacturers. Uh, yes, well, of course, it's not just Trump who's called for Europe to, to increase its military spending. I think every Euro U.S. president has done that since, um, since Eisenhower. Uh, but let's keep something in mind here. Um, however much Europeans spend on defense, European soldiers will not fight Russia to defend Ukraine. They just won't. I mean, that's been made clear again and again. Nor most probably will uh, will U.S. soldiers. Uh, therefore, I mean, two things to keep in mind. First, uh, sanctions may not be very effective or possibly at all effective, as Masha has said, but they are the only deterrent that we've got because we won't fight. Uh, the soldiers being sent um, to Eastern Europe are purely symbolic because Russia does not have the slightest intention of attacking NATO. It will be a crazy thing to do. Uh, by the way, Russia has repeatedly denied that it's going to attack Ukraine. Uh, so a great deal of this is, I'm afraid, theatrics on the part of the West.